It was from the second prize winner, Team France. Next presentation is from third prize winner, Team Mongolia. Please uh, come up to the stage. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We are Team Mongolia, and my name is Chimit Dirikseng, and my colleague, Fatfire. So we are students, master students of college engineering at Seoul National University. So today we will cover about these areas. So currently, by June 20th, uh, total confirmed cases globally reached 8.5 million. So just around like May 30th, uh, total confirmed cases uh, reached uh, 6 million. And then in a very, very short time, like less than two weeks, it reached 7 million. And then less than like three weeks, it reached 8 million. Today it reached 9 million, which means COVID-19. It's not finished. It's actually uh, continue rising in a very, very short time with big amounts. And if you see this graph, uh, the death, the mortality rate uh, in January was about like 2.3%, and in May 11th, it reached 6.9%. And then it looks like it is decreasing. And um, by June 20th, the mortality rate reached 5.3%. And total a death by June 20th reached 456,000 globally. So let's look back what happened in January. Uh, WHO received some information actually in December 31st, 2019 that there is this uh, disease and Chinese authorities informed that they have identified this new type of coronavirus through laboratory testing. And uh, from many resources, they say that this uh, disease uh, originated in a seafood market in Wuhan. And by June 1st, so this seafood market was closed down. And uh, WHO received some reports on uh, January 14th. And then at that time, the total confirmed cases reached 41, and the first death occurred. And then uh, Wuhan city was closed down, uh, closed down, which has 11 million people. That is a really, really big number. And because Mongolia is a neighboring country, it's between China and Russia. So we knew that we were in a big, big, serious condition. So if we look at the current conditions globally, uh, by June 20th, the total confirmed cases is 8.7 million, and then like more than 50% of the confirmed cases are in American continent. And there are some countries which has more confirmed cases, such as USA, they have like 2.2 million, and Brazil, over 1 million, and Russia, 584,000, India, 410,000. And currently, by June 20, uh, Mongolia, we have uh, 204 confirmed cases. So when this thing happened in January, so our government of officials, the Mongolian uh, State Emergency Commission, uh, had a mil uh, meeting which held in January 27. And then they discussed about this disease in China and then they had took some serious actions starting from January. And if you see this graph here, so the schools was closed down and then they had shut down many events, restricted like public gathering and things like that. And until March 10th, we did not have any cases because our government was quick to take responses. And then the first uh, case reported on March 20th. But we had closed down our borders in January, 
uh, 27 with China, and then it increased to all the other countries. So all these cases which we have now, the, these are actually uh, didn't get transmitted in Mongolia. So government decided to bring back our nationals so from different countries, even though we closed down the border. So they made a schedule and then gradually bringing back their uh, nationals uh, with special chartered flights. And then uh, March 10th, it was the first case. It was like French nationalists, uh, which came to France and came back to Mongolia to work. And then all the people who was coming back to Mongolia, so they were tested and quarantined for like 14 days. Later, they increased it to 21 days. And then that was the first case. And then it increased like gradually. So by June's uh, 20th, so the total confirmed cases in Mongolia reached like 193. And then currently we have a zero death and local zero, zero local transmission. And if you see this graph here, so there are more female, I mean, female is 67, a male patients are 126. And then if you see their ages, it's about 20 to 24. And um, these people, majority, which is 173 patients, actually they were students who were studying in Russia, and then they were brought back to Mongolia through this special chartered flight, and then later they confirmed with COVID. And then, so there are some patients uh, who brought back from like South Korea, Germany, France, Turkey and others. So still we have some schedules in June and also July to fly chartered flights to bring our nationals. So our strategy is to, to bring these people like gradually and then as soon as they come they are quarantined and tested. So they are quarantined about like 21 days. So that is the strategy that we still don't have a local transmissions. And as I mentioned, so there was a special meeting, uh, state emergency commission meeting, which held in January 27, uh, 24th. And then they have made some serious decisions. So first one was to close down all the schools, including kindergarten universities. And also the Ministry of Health, she was uh, ordered to prepare like medical supplies and buy equipment for the hospitals just to prepare. So all these things took place in January just to prepare. And also, um, they prepared like a special fund and also some of the areas, some of the provinces were uh, closed down. And there's a big event in Mongolia like Lunar New Year, so which was canceled. So they stopped all these like public gathering, things like that, just to prevent from the COVID-19. And because government took some serious actions, so our total confirmed cases is still very low, like 200 and zero local transmissions. But our government uh, wanted to support like other countries. So in February 27th, the president of Mongolia, Batola, he visited China and then gave some like donations to fight the COVID-19. So the picture you can see on the right side there. And then also just yesterday they flew a special flight to USA, which landed in Seattle. And then they donated some like medical supplies and they will bring back some like 260 Mongolian nationals back to Mongolia. And also uh, in May 26, the prime minister, Hrusuk, visit, uh, gave some donations to Russia, some medical supplies and things like that. And since this uh, outbreak, uh, Mongolian uh, scientists and medical experts, they are working on, on the cases and then they have developed uh, a test locally and then currently so we can test uh, this COVID-19 to diagnose and which is uh, effective now. And now my colleague, Bud Bayer, will continue the presentation. Let's welcome him. Okay, thank you. Okay, good.
Good afternoon, everybody. So let me continue the presentation by the, some impacts on the economic and uh, industries. So as you can see that the graph, so most of the Mongolia exports they went down, especially international trade turned over. Turn, uh, international turnover has fell down by the 58.5 percentage due to the coronavirus. And it's, this statistic is, is comes from the last four months. And especially, you can see the raw coal export and crude oil, oil export also decreased down. Especially, the coal, is, coal export uh, went down 2.6 times as compared to the last year. And the crude oil export also decreased by the five times in the last year. So, as you Okay, this is uh, general information about the economic impact, and I'm going to move to the next slide. It's about the education system, how it's impacted on the, our education system. As you see, the 53% of the, the schools are located in the urban area, including the Lambatar city in Mongolia. So all of those located in the urban areas has connected to the high-speed internet connectivity, and less of them. Uh, 47 of the, the students' you know, schools are located in a rural area, that, but they are not connected to the internet perfectly. Or, or since uh, 2000, January 27th of the 2020, so our government decided to make uh, some online study, and the online study, online lecture should be organized by the also 18 TV channels, and so also it's able to deliver, deliver it by the video lessons, uh, so for the each uh, the video lessons should uh, last only one or ten or twenty minutes. Also, they provide them CD and a hard copy of the, these uh, lessons for the rural area the schools. They don't have internet access. And that next is about the, about the, actually some people say that Mongolia is a the, the lowest density population in the world, but it's not actually like that. Especially our uh, capital city is uh, the same as another big city for the density, population density. And you can see the graph, it's, uh, it's graph show us the, uh, show us the, the population density of our capital city. It's the same as almost the big countries in Europe. It's, uh, for example, 300 and more than pupils per square. And so that's why our government is taking some actions for the support in the livelihoods and public health sectors, and especially in the high density the areas. Also, this slide is about uh, some passenger traffic. So because of the, this kind of imp imp impacts, so, uh, so, so many industries impacted by the, this issue. So one of them is the tourist and especially uh, service-oriented uh, service -oriented industry impacted. For example, this passenger traffic by the air is decreased by the 20, 42 percentage in compared to the last two years. And also we stopped everything such as a train and car to come into my country. And so, so it's decreased by the 5.8 percentage. And so last big cha challenge is about uh, some, so many of the Mongolian people are stuck in the foreign countries. They cannot come into the Mongolia. So that's why the, so this statistics say that more than 10,000 citizens are stuck in the foreign countries. So some of them already struck, striking to the Mongolian government decision. They want to come immediately in the country. So around uh, 57 countries the Mongolian people stuck it, and they cannot come in the country, so it's also one big challenge. But even though the Mongolian government also is still have some taking actions to make to the, to bring the, those peoples in there, so as I mentioned, the, the, we have some special charter of sites to bring the, those peoples. It's already scheduled, and this is uh, I would like to conclude the, this presentation and. So reason of that the, we have a zero local transmission and zero dates because of the coronavirus. 
So first we, our government followed the WHO recommendation and worked closely with them. And the next is maybe, uh, so we took already some quick actions that is as soon as possible to limit the local transmission and COVID-19 outbreaks also. The one thing is the people are very good as to follow the government decision and order the prevent from the some disease. And also we closed the borders and to limit the foreign visitors and local visitors. This could be one of the reason why we don't have this kind of disease in my country. Also, if someone come to the in my country, at least it should be in a quarantine for the 21 days. After these 21 days, also it should be quarantined at, at home. Okay. So this is actually the conclusion part. Thank you. So the presentation from was uh, the presentation was from Team Mongolia. The next presentation is going to be from uh, Team Uzbekistan. Please come up to the front and make a presentation, please. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for giving me such opportunity. Uh, it seems like uh, we need some energy for discussion after the presentation, so I'll try to be not boring, and uh, I will try to omit some obvious and repetitive things and uh, extract more uh, interesting facts. Uh, I'm from College of Engineering. <clears throat> and uh, this is the outline of my presentation and uh, I will give you two facts about my country uh, we are uh, there are two double landlocked countries in the world and Uzbekistan is one of that countries that means that in order to reach an ocean we need to cross two borders and the second uh, fact is that we are Uzbekistan and all our neighbors are stand countries Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan and Kyrgyzstan. Uh, so this is the timeline and uh, <clears throat> Vietnamese teams they uh, divided the COVID situation to three or four periods so I divided it to five periods and uh, our preparation started uh, one and a half months before the first patient we had at the January 29 the uh, governmental commission headed by Prime Minister was uh, created and we had the first patient at the, uh, on uh, March 15 and the, at the next day uh, we started the total lockdown uh, public transportation, cafes, everything was were closed, and uh, we started to searching some uh, decisions, some something to, to we uh, our government tried to do something, and then uh, after a few days they cancelled or changed so. It was a kind of searching uh, possible solutions, and the country was divided to three type of zones: uh, red, uh, yellow, and green. And this made an effect. Uh, this is a, not a total cases. This is an active cases uh, graph. So this made an effect, and uh, in the beginning of May we started the step-by-step -step softening and as a result now nowadays we have um, around 2,000 active cases and more than 6,000 uh, total cases and the final period post-COVID uh, there is a two questions I don't know what will happen and what 
uh, and when will it begin? So, uh, so we started to create uh, quarantine zones and hospitals, especially for COVID patients. And uh, our government tried to be transparent, and uh, we we created the online map. But after 1,500 cases, the this map uh, is uh, was um, like uh, the, 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 there is now there is no um, uh, updates on that uh, map. So uh, yeah, um, and academia and um, public education also responded for that. So. The universities uh, made the uh, entrance exams easier, uh, and the, uh, yeah, and also final exams uh, were omitted. Uh, and a lot of people created the, the, the volunteers created the help groups for uh, another people and uh, businesses. And the the firstly. We divided the whole um, country to 14, 14 um, zones, uh, that is our regions. And after that, uh, we divided it to 200 zone, zones. And um, this is uh, volunteers. Uh, she is a very famous uh, singer. And he's an actor, so uh, I think everyone knows what is this or this. So we decided to uh, build a, quarantine zones that um, that are located outside of hospitals that we already have, but. Uh, we have a limited resources like uh, funds, people, etc. But the main resource is time. We didn't have time. So uh, we decided to use old used containers to create uh, uh, mobile hospitals yeah. and transport them to the regions that are uh, that need and this is how it looks like we can see conditioners uh, yeah and the TV antennas yeah and uh, I don't know how effective is this in economic or uh, healthcare point of view but um, we started to export this so this is uh, Tajikistan our neighbor country so we are exporting Nowadays, uh, we exported 144 uh, containers to them. This is also the uh, capital of Tajikistan. They used the um, stadium to place this, our uh, boxes. And each box has television and conditioner, and uh, it can um, it so it is for three to four people yeah and also hot water and shower included yeah so uh, impact and challenge um, well budget optimizations the salary of public servants became lower the all extra payments uh, were Cancelled, and also we mm, increased the debt limit. And mm, yeah, we had we uh, after we got the first case, uh, it was a um, patient from France. Hi to a team from France. Yeah. Uh, our, uh, the, 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 the first patient, she is a woman, and 
she faced a kind of cyber bullying, uh, including like physical threats. Yeah. So uh, police uh, decided to try to yeah, find the people that bullied her. So it is a kind of unreadiness, maybe, of society. And um, it was difficult to find the statistical information, but I found only about individual entrepreneurs. 80% uh, of individual entrepreneurs uh, decided to temporarily uh, stop their uh, activity, entrepreneurial activity. Uh, about telecom infrastructure, she is a teacher and she is sitting in a roof of her house in a rural area and uh, this is a screenshot from the video that uh, became very popular and uh, started a new discussion about the uh, accessibility to mobile internet in our country. Yeah. And also, the, here is the February, March, and April, and this is the uh, number of requesting for tax benefits from a tax agency in our country, and number of transactions between individuals and companies, be between them and the budget. Uh, th this is also ab about the taxes, so we can see the impact. Uh, I don't have conclusion, but I have uh, the kind of post-COVID discussion. Uh, so mm, I don't know how to comment this, but it seems um, that we will recognize this this later. But in our country, the uh, cats and dogs, uh, because of uh, COVID situation, they. Uh, a lot of them were uh, rejected outside, uh, yeah. and yeah, uh, our government agencies are so um, conservative, but even they also understood that it is possible to work remotely, and this I think this is a very uh, kind of uh, big. Uh, issue and yeah we decided to pay uh, money for the tourists that if, if tourists came to Uzbekistan and uh, have a infection COVID infection then government will pay uh, I think three thousand yeah. dollars and also uh, I think this period the COVID period is the most transparent period of our government and I never saw such transparency and also the democratic uh, process I mean in the meaning that uh, when government decided something and then people started to criticize or ask questions etc and government started to find the solutions they cancel they change they try to find the, uh, they try to operate, uh, the response operate. Yeah. This is all of my presentation. Thank you. So it was the presentation from Uzbekistan. The next team is uh, team Iran, uh, please come up to the front and make a presentation, please. Hello everyone, I am Zoleha from Iran and it's my turn to talk about the uh, trend, impacts and post-COVID-19 challenges in my country. Uh, 
The first official announcement of this from COVID-19 was made on uh, February 19 in Qom, which is uh, the uh, city in the uh, center of, the, our, of our country. And uh, after the first peak in the late March, the number of daily cases began to wane in the early April. But again, Iran had second peak in uh, June 2nd, and the number of new COVID-19 infection has been uh, running near uh, or about 3,000. As uh, of uh, June 5th, uh, total confirmed cases was uh, 169,000 uh, more than it. Uh, total associated death, uh, death uh, was uh, more than 8,000, and total recovered cases was uh, uh, 132,000 more than this, and new cases were uh, 2,269 2, per day. In uh, June 12, uh, the death rate was 5.6 percent, the recovery rate was 94 percent. In March uh, uh, 15, the minimum age uh, for death was three years old child with uh, leukemia, and the maximum was 91 years old. Also, the ratio of male to female was uh, is a quarter. The average age of a, uh, infected people was uh, 40, was 55, uh, four, and uh, the, for this it was 67 years. The most common symptom also uh, was fever and cough, and the almost uh, more than one million tests had performed uh, by uh, June 12. Uh, what government, our government uh, did for uh, uh, do controlling COVID-19, on uh, February 19, all incoming passengers from China would be uh, uh, monitored and examined. And that uh, suspicious cases would be transferred to the hospital uh, uh, designed for the, this purpose. The government in March 2nd announced a March 1st announced a series of contain, uh, containment measures, including ordering the closure of non-essential essential businesses and banning inter-city travel. School and university were also shut, while religious, cultural, and sporting events were banned, and soccer matches and movie screening also was uh, suspended. The uh, working hour of government office offices have been reduced, and uh, so important event, Friday prayer, uh, that is the most important uh, event for Muslim countries, was uh, also cancelled. The central bank effort for uh, control the COVID-19, including increasing the car-to-card -car trans uh, transaction, selling, ex uh, attending the expiration date of bank, uh, card, uh, bank card and uh, rising the cash withdrawal limit. The distribution of new bank notes and the receipt and payment of the cash in bank was also banned. Health Minister promised to uh, treatment uh, free treatment for COVID-19 patients and also dedicating the 230 hospital for fighting the COVID-19 and also they had uh, they unveil the uh, kit for the um, COVID-19, and it, uh, the capacity of this was uh, 100,000 units per week. Uh, also, uh, they had a system called salamet.gov.ir uh, website that uh, it was screening of uh, COVID-19 by completing the existing questions and uh, 69 a million people uh, participated uh, out of 83 uh, million uh, of Iran population, providing uh, providing uh, 750,000 uh, billion real to in facilities to uh, damage uh, businesses at the pref uh, preferential rate of uh, 12 percent. And another important thing uh, is uh, the policy of social distance and home quarantine on uh, March 31 has uh, uh, was uh, performed. Before the implementation of the social distance plan, 3,000 people affected in a day. 
And with the implication of this social distance and uh, quarantine, the number of patients has decreased to 2,000. Uh, person loan. And uh, also, uh, uh, the Ministry of Cultural Heritage uh, uh, um, uh, estimated that tourism and uh, dam the damages of the, this would be uh, 3,800 billion to one. Uh, social impact, the trans uh, we had the transition from individualism to collectivism. The non-holding of Friday prayer, the closure of holy shrines, seminars, mosques, and other religious uh, uh, celebrations provide that things that uh, we, uh, were considered impossible have become possible. Changing the function of mosque, under the influence of the prevalence of COVID-19, the people have changed their social relation in the extent of cyberspace online, Significant reduction of time saving on the cost of the conferences and, and large meetings. And also, uh, parents had more time for children, and uh, uh, parents' interaction with their children have increased from 20 minutes to uh, two hours a day. And traffic reduced, uh, fuel uh, consumption from, reduced from uh, 105 liters to uh, uh, 52 liters per month. And changing of the style of worship, and 51% uh, of people celebrate Adr night, which is the holy night for uh, people, in, uh, through the cyber green, in, in the cyber uh, space instead of the uh, mosque. And in term of, uh, terms of challenges, COVID-19 can ex ex uh, exa uh, exacerbate the risk of class deviation and also unemployment and hopelessness for people who are generally at home and their social relations have diminished. Depression and other negative psychological measures intensified because almost the majority of Iran people are in, are in formal labor. Suddenly, uh, 5,000 uh, addicted people in Tehran, uh, capital uh, of Iran, and uh, they were released, and their uh, detention uh, centers were closed. Uh, by uh, but this has not yet been resolved. This can be catastrophic. This crisis of ignoring is silent, and it will create a bad situation in future. In Iran, at least 30 percent of the economy is informal, but no uh, program or uh, policy has been. Um, developed for this uh, sector and also the consequence, consequences of this uh, situation can be exacerbated by poverty, murder, extortion and violence and the rich began to build walls around themselves and it is uh, in another word uh, people uh, diverge. Religion plays a balanced role in many areas in Iran. Some of these religious institutions may fade over time and it is difficult to revenue them. Uh, affected people should not be blamed and uh, on the other hand, using negative words such as victims, suspicious people, etc. and etc. has negative consequences for them. Uh, these, these days, uh, also we uh, follow the COVID-19 news and we should uh, take care uh, of elementary and preschool children. Families have many complaints about the use of the chat system. It is online system for the uh, online class of elementary to high school uh, students, partly due to the slowness of the internet and partly due to the lack of financial means uh, to provide mobile phone or internet uh, prices and also uh, the, uh, low connection problem, which has uh, doubled the problem of families with the current economic situation. Economic estimates uh, that economics uh, estimate that it, in the face of uh, 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 pessimism, uh, there is a possibility that Iran's domestic production will fall to uh, two thirds of the current level. Iran is doing not well about patient freaking strategy. We don't have any online application or any tracking system 
or any database for uh, uh, COVID-19 patients, South Korea can be a really good system to follow this. Thank you. It was presentation from uh, Team Iran. Next team is going to be uh, Team United States. Uh, please come up to the stage. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Good? Okay, um, so first of all, I just want to acknowledge the fact that this has been a really crazy and scary and unpredictable, unpredictable semester for all of us. Um, and every single one of the presenters that came here today had to watch as really frightening things happened in our home countries. And a lot of us are not going to be able to go home and hug our families for a really long time. Uh, so the fact that everyone was able to complete this paper and a presentation in the middle of finals is really amazing. So everybody give yourself a round of applause. <clears throat> um, I really wish that people from my country could watch everyone's presentation today because I think we could use a lot of the advice that some of you presented today. So normally in this kind of global crisis, the United States would provide some kind of leadership or guidance to the rest of the world. Uh, and we are leading the world, but unfortunately not in a way that I or anyone should be proud of. Um, we're currently number one in COVID-19 cases and deaths, which is really unfortunate. So I wish I had a little bit more positive things to talk about in my presentation. Um, but I just first want to say that I'm really sorry uh, and disappointed and kind of heartbroken that my country did not use the huge amount of resources that they had at their disposal um, and they, they didn't use them to help themselves or help the world. So today uh, I'm going to take you on a journey through the COVID-19 era starting back in January. Can everyone think what was life like just five months ago? It's crazy. We live in a totally different world. Uh, so I'm going to take you through step by step. Uh, so here is uh, some social media posts that were from my Facebook page uh, from January 25th. And at that point, there were two cases recorded in the United States, both of them imported from Wuhan, China. Um, and there was a lot of discussion online that kind of insinuated that, oh, like, of course, this sort of thing would happen in a country like China uh, because of culture, because of government, whatever. Um, and, you know, people made some pretty racist and unfair remarks, I think. And uh, as our president said, he predicted that coronavirus will have a very good end for us, which now it sounds insane. Uh, but um, at that point in time, I think a lot of Americans really did not think that this would have the impact that it ended up having on our country. They just thought, like, this sort of thing could not happen in the US. But of course, they were wrong. Um, so starting around January 31st, uh, it was the first case of US transmitted uh, uh, case of COVID-19. And if you look at the comments, uh, you see that people are still downplaying the risks so people are saying, oh, you know, it's just 170 people out of 8 billion on the Earth. Like, it's not a big thing to worry about. Or you see at the bottom, um, here? Oh. Uh, so Chad Ponder said, oh, I mean, the flu has killed 8,000 people. So people didn't think it was going to be a big problem. So how, what steps did my government take to combat the virus? On January 31st, uh, a presidential order was decided that prevented uh, anyone coming from China from entering the United States. 
However, this failed to account for the fact that the vast majority of cases in the United States would actually originate from Europe, but uh, that uh, Europeans were not blocked uh, into the United States. Uh, on February 25th, when there were 39 patients, still no deaths, uh, President Donald Trump said, the coronavirus is very much under control in the United States. Um, however, because they weren't doing any testing, we actually had no grounds to be making that statement because we really didn't know what the situation was going to be like. Um, and at that point, this is kind of around the time that things got really scary here in Korea. And I remember around this time, I was thinking, you know, maybe, Maybe I should go home. Should I, should I take this semester off? No, I, 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 bought, a I bought a plane ticket. I almost went. Uh, and it's crazy, like, if I had made that decision, uh, I wouldn't be here today, and you know, the conditions I'd be living under would be very, very different. So yeah, it's, it's just crazy how fast things can change. Um, on March 10th, my alma mater, my undergraduate university, uh, canceled the rest of the semester when students were on spring break. So they left for vacation and then with no idea that anything was going to change for them. And then they never went back. So people, they didn't get to say goodbye to their friends. They had to suddenly start doing all of their classes online. People had trouble getting their belongings from their dorms. Uh, it was kind of very chaotic. And around this time, uh, the number of patients and deaths started to increase in the United States. So there was 1,000 patients, 32 deaths at this point. Um, on March 16th, I, this is a, a real conversation that I had with people that I know from my hometown. Um, around this time, a lot of workplaces started requesting that people work from home or asking people not to come into the office. So uh, the gentleman who, he's in blue in here, he said, COVID better get bad and cost something worth all of this, bad word, um, good chance I won't be getting paid because my office closed. Cool story. Thanks for blowing a mild flu into Ebola. Um, and I mean, I'm really sorry to say it, but that's truly what a lot of people in the United States thought at that point. They thought these measures, it's an overreaction. We have the best healthcare system in the world. so." We can handle this. Um, and some people even said that you know, asking people to stay home, uh, it's, a, it's a violation of their constitutional rights. Um, you can see the, the gentleman in the green made that point there. Um, I, I think a lot of Americans, because they've never actually lived through authoritarianism or you know, an oppressive form of government, they don't really know what oppression is, like asking someone to wear a mask so that they don't infect others, I don't think, you know, that's such a crazy, oppressive thing to do. But uh, I think American individualist culture kind of uh, promoted that kind of thinking. Uh, and the, the woman in orange, uh, she said something that really shocked me uh, when I read it. Um, you can read the rest of the comments, but she said, there's a reason that it targets the elderly and not everyone. There's no reason to close businesses and panic. Um, I'm really hoping that this virus pulls through on its promise and does what it is intended to clean up, which I thought was really disgusting. Um, but, and of course, this does not reflect how all Americans thought, but like, this is, these are people that I knew and grew up with that I, I thought I knew the kinds of person that they are. Um, I was really disappointed to see uh, their reactions to the situation. Um, March 21st, uh, 26,000 patients in the US, 302 deaths. Um, President Donald Trump made the unscientifically based claim that uh, chloroquine, which is a treatment for malaria, uh, could be used as a treatment for COVID-19, and this sparked a complete selling out of the, the medicine in countries that actually really needed it. Um, so there's kind of not really like a filter or like a, uh, in Korea, for instance, uh, the information was very consistent. 
uh, coming from scientifically backed sources. Everyone was repeating the same information over and over again, but that's not what we saw in the US, and the result was really disastrous. Um, however, you know, it's, it's not everybody that's you know, just acting this way. Uh, a lot of people did try to go out of their way to help the situation. Um, so at that point, the American CDC was actually telling people not to buy or wear medical masks. Um, and that's because we didn't have a sufficient number of the masks in the United States. So even doctors and nurses couldn't get them. Uh, so they were actively telling people, don't wear a mask. Uh, it's not necessary. And it's, it could actually prevent people who need it from getting it. Um, so what a lot of people started doing is making their own masks from home and giving them either to people in their community or um, doctors and nurses that were working with non-coronavirus patients. So that's a good thing, I guess. Um, uh, by April 1st, it became clear that the situation was totally out of control in the United States. I believe that's around the time that we took the number one spot for uh, infections and deaths, or, or infections of COVID-19. Um, so I think that, that was really surprising to a lot of people who, you know, just a few weeks prior to that statement had thought that this wasn't really going to affect the United States at all. Um, on April 15th, uh, South Korea, which had just held its uh, midterm election, and without a single case uh, transmitted, which is really impressive, uh, they sold a bunch of... Um, and 95 masks to the United States because we, we still didn't have a lot of our own at that point. Uh, so thanks, Korea. Um, that's, that's good. Um, and at that point, there was 635,000 patients and over 30,000 deaths from COVID. Um, so the numbers keep going up, but in starting in May, uh, the Trump administration started pushing for the economy to open again. Uh, I don't really know what the backing was for that, um, especially since in the United States, uh, there are certainly a lot of jobs that are more difficult to transport to like the working at home uh, model. But um, I would argue that the US is probably better equipped than a lot of countries uh, to enforce that kind of model, but we, we didn't. Um, and then here, this is a picture of the president in a mask factory, touching the masks with hands that are not. Possible infection. Um, around May 30, on May 31st, um, I, it was mentioned earlier at the beginning of this conference, uh, the very unfortunate and sad and just awful uh, death of George Floyd uh, happened at the hands of police in Minneapolis. And it was actually found in his, autops in his autopsy that he was actually infected with COVID-19. Uh, he wasn't aware of it before he died. But um, this is really unfortunate um, because minorities are disproportionately affected by COVID-19 in the United States and also have a higher rate of death than other groups. Um, so in response to the police violence, uh, people took to the streets in protest. Um, and I, I'm not sure exactly what the science says after, but um, I was personally nervous to see so many people gathered all together. I, I think the, the cause that they were supporting is, of course, very important. Um, but it makes me worry that maybe this will pr just cause even more spread of the disease among people who are already disproportionately affected by COVID-19. Um, this is these are two posts that I found on June 18th, so just four days ago. Um, even though COVID-19 has claimed the lives of over 120,000 American citizens as of today, there are still people who think that the virus is a political hoax or like it's, it's made up to prevent uh, Donald Trump from getting 
reelected. And I, I don't know what to say to that, but um, I read, and, and when I was doing research for the paper, I found 45% of Americans still refuse to wear masks, even though we have the highest infection and death rate in the world, uh, which is unfortunate. And then yesterday, uh, the president held a rally in uh, Oklahoma, and he continued to, he, he didn't call the coronavirus by its official name, he's been calling it the Kung Flu, I guess, which is supposed to blame China, I don't know. Um, so, yeah, this is statistics. So, what happened? Uh, I think, as I mentioned earlier, I think a lot of people in the United States, as well as a lot of Western countries, assumed that, oh, because epidemics are not a problem for us anymore. It's a problem of developing countries. And even if it comes here, it's not going to be that serious. But I'm, American exceptionalism may be alive in American politics today, but we are not an exception to biology or epidemiology. Uh, I think a lot of people were kind of forced to face that fact today. Um, there's also a lot of disjointed communication within the government. So the president would say one thing, the CDC would say another thing, doctors were saying another thing, and it made it really, really hard to inform the public about what the statistics truly were and what they can do to protect themselves. Um, and I think like the kind of America first ideology, it, uh, it weakened the United States' relationships with its allies and other countries in the world, and it made it really hard to get a hold of the materials and information that we needed to make the best decisions that we could. Um, so that's my presentation for today. Uh, thank you so much for coming today. So it was the presentation from United States. Uh, the next presentation will be given by Mal Team Malaysia. Uh, Team Malaysia, please come up to the stage. So including the Team Malaysia, we have two presentations left. The last presentation will be from uh, Trinidad and Tobago, uh, which is recorded uh, from our country. Start. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, we are from Team Malaysia. So basically, there are three of us that completing, uh, completed this report. So my name is Razi Sazali, and with my colleagues is Sarah Iza Azriz from Interdisciplinary Program in Landscape Architecture and also Isna Zakia Fadrin from Department of Foreign Science. So basically, we're gonna, go, we're gonna walk you through on how we are dealing with the COVID-19, specifically in Malaysia. So, okay, we're gonna cover on three methods, which is trend, controlling, and also impacts. So for starting, uh, previously Malaysia was dealing, uh, had experience dealing with another pandemic, such as SARS in 2003, uh, swine flu in 2009, uh, avian influenza in 2013, and also MERS COVID in 2014. So, uh, before this, Malaysia is ranked 18 in the 2019 Global Health, and particularly for the infections, we are ranked first. That's so proud of it. And also, uh, first COVID-19 is happening in Malaysia, uh, was recorded at the end of February, and Malaysia is as I, another country, Malaysia also was not sure what I, we are dealing for because certainly this is a new virus that's happening around the world. We started uh, with, uh, we have so far, we have six phases uh, in terms of movement control measure. So we started uh, from 18 March where we started with the enhanced movement control. There are four phases of the EMCO. And then we walk through to the conditional movement control order, CMCO, and currently we are in the requirement movement control order or known as RMCO. So uh, as June 9th, uh, we have a total of 8,336 cases, uh, 
total of 117 cases and specifically on that day, we have 281 cute cases, which is the highest among all the time. And on that day also, we have seven new cases, which are six, we call it as imported cases, where returning from abroad, where we uh, citizens are coming from the outside of the country, and also one local transmission. These three peoples are basically the, I would say, the, the true leaders, because they, they are the ones uh, helping the nations to battle with this pandemic. So they are like our Prime Minister, Muhyiddin, Transit Muhyiddin Yassin, uh, our Secretary, the, sorry, Director General of Health, which is uh, since 2013, which is Datuk Sri Hisham, and also Dr. Marina Osman, which is the epidemiologist and biostatistic expert. So we categorize into like the earliest five main clusters, as you can see. Um, these are the five main clusters that cause, like, I would say, like the starting point of the viruses become worse in the country. So this is the statistic, but since the enhancement of the control order, the numbers are being seen to go drop from day to day. So going on the controlling COVID-19 by different actors, uh, my team and I has gathered on few ideas regarding on what the central government did, on local government, academia, and also from the civil society perspective. Starting on with the central government, the containment phase, where I mentioned about the control movement order. Uh, basically, it's, it was announced two days before, which is on March 16, uh, by our Prime Minister. We started with the movement control order for 14 days, from March 18 to 31st of March. Uh, this is derived from the religious cluster, is one of the clusters that I showed you earlier. And also, uh, this strictly enforced on the provision on mass gathering, including cultural, sports, religious and social. So, what does the central government did? Well, they enhanced with the national carrying aid where they provide 20 billion, equivalent to 4.7 billion US dollar, uh, to help the citizens of Malaysia, where specifically they started with the uh, special allowance for medical personnel and also the frontliners. They also giving discount to the tourism sector in terms of electricity, uh, commercial industry, and also they given the one-off payment uh, of around one hundred fifty dollars to the taxi driver because of they also uh, they are sell they basically affected by this pandemic also because they cannot have the tourism sector is uh, the main of the tourism sector is affected so somehow they also resulted from that. On top of that, the government also provided free speed internet and uh, they also deferment of loans such as uh, the small medium uh, entrepreneur loans, uh, taxes. On, uh, on the other hand, they also provided uh, or make another allocation or budget for the hospitals to support uh, for the medical treatment for the COVID-19 and also, like I said before, suspension of uh, months, six months for the repayment of debt for specifically for education loan. And looking from the central government, as we have 14 states in Malaysia, uh, the Prime Minister keep on updating on the COVID-19 update. They also enforce on law where they uh, started with the compound because we have movement control order. So whoever that against it or like doing a fault, they will be compound with the uh, fine. And also the, uh, the government encourage for the retired medical personnel to return to service. They are providing contracts and salary in order for them to help on top of the current additional medical services. And they use the hotel, they try basically transform the use of hotel and learning institution as part of the center of quarantine. Besides that, the government also uh, basically specifically for local government, they also care for the homeless. They adapt the standard operating for procedure for the COVID-19 prevention, they catered for Rohingya refugees, and also from the Peninsula of Malaysia, Sabah and Sarawak, they, start, they strictly uh, restrict on the entry and exit of the states. From the academia and civil society, uh, 
we we can somehow started on the online learning mode and all the fashion designers specifically local designers they started to change and help on making a PPE to to be donated or to help on the medical personnel and like before this we used to shake hand whenever we meet everyone like we hug every shakes so we start somehow we changed to the new norm where we started to just make it like this to uh, show our respect to another person. So next I'm going to pass it over to my colleague for the next presentation. Again, good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. My name is Isna, so I'm going to discuss on the impacts of COVID-19 uh, towards Malaysia. So COVID-19 has uh, impacted uh, a lot of sectors which includes economy, social security, education system, social and culture, international aid, and also sports. Uh, in terms of economy, so like any other country, we also have been uh, experienced a lot of loss. So daily loss of 2.4 billion ringgit Malaysia during the MCO period, which is the uh, control order period, and it's a total of 63 billion ringgit Malaysia. And also um, due to this, Malaysia Central Bank has provided an alternative uh, overnight policy weight um, to encourage the individu individuals and also businesses to take new loans so that it will it can increase the domestic trade transaction and also banking sectors has provided two billion ringgit Malaysia of funding to support uh, small and medium uh, enterprise with concession rates of 3.5 percent to target new SME customers to banks and also for domestic economy uh, 67 67.8% of the total, more than 4,000 Malaysian companies has responded to a no sales uh, during MCO period and uh, this also has caused an unemployment levels which has contributed to a fall in private consumption. However, on the other hand, online sales of fast-moving consumer goods has grown rapidly of 40% and also postal and Korea is the least impacted sectors. Um, so in 2020, uh, Malaysia has aimed for our own Visit Malaysia campaign, but unfortunately, uh, but for this Visit Malaysia campaign, we are, we are supposed to attract more than 30 million tourists from outside. And actually tourism has accounted for 5.8% of the country's GDP in 2018, which is uh, more than 41 uh, billion ringgit Malaysia. On, uh, for the nation during the first half of 2019. <laughs> however, uh, this has created, however, because of uh, COVID-19, it has created a lot of loss, which is uh, approximately 560 million uh, ringgit Malaysia of revenues. And also among 56,000 workers in hotel industry, 2,000 people were said to be laid off and 17% were asked to take unpaid leaves and more than 9% got pay cut. And also for electric and electronic sectors, it has created a loss of more than 7 billion ringgit Malaysia. And for social security, education, social and cultural, um, uh, so in Malaysia to... to in order to face uh, COVID-19, uh, we have the Social Security Act of 1969, where workers may claim for compensation if they are contracted with COVID-19. And also, uh, the government has uh, created a six-month moratorium for repayment for personal loans and moratorium for small, medium enterprise. And also, for education, like any other countries, we are also doing our online class and but because of this, um, there's, of course, there is a marginalized and low-income families which does not have access to internet, also electronic devices, and as well for the rural areas. And for the social and cultural, uh, we have created this online wedding norm, which we call as Nika Online. And also, um, uh, du uh, during COVID-19, we have this, uh, our biggest religious uh, celebration, but due to COVID-19, we have uh, we have stopped this. And for those who visit their close relatives, they are compounded with 1,000 ringgit Malaysia. 
And we have received international aids of uh, medical supplies from China in March, and also global fund program by World Health Organization. And of course, as everyone, in 2020, we are supposed to have the Tokyo Olympic Games where Malaysia aimed to get our first gold medal. But this is, uh, this is going to be hard because of all of the athletes' training program has been affected. And for those athletes qualified for Tokyo Olympic Games, they will train under quarantine state. And also, the Malaysian Games on July 2020 has been postponed to next year. Okay, I will pass on to Sarah. So I will talk more about challenges. Uh, of course, there's a lot of challenges, but um, I'm going to share with you four of the most um, talked about in Malaysia. So, um, of course, the first one is about internet penetration. Um, although you know that Malaysia has um, pretty much 80% penetration in Southeast Asia, but if you're living in the urban areas, then of course you definitely get internet easily. But for those living in the deep forests of Pahang and perhaps in remote areas like in Sabah, Sarawak, then it's going to be really hard to get. So if you notice in social media, there's one lady who's actually a university student. She has to climb a tree in order for her to get to receive Wi-Fi just so that she can attend classes. Um, um, and then uh, our government has developed two kinds of application, just like any other countries. We have My Sejahtera, which was developed by Ministry of Health, consisting of um, all the COVID-19 health guidelines, including information on the nearest health facilities. And then there's also um, Hotspot Tracker. Whereas, on the other hand, Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation developed MyTrace app, which um, the reason for this app is to identify of those in close proximity to an infected person. And then, of course, during this pandemic, there's definitely a lot of um, spreading of fake news. So in order for us to counter this, it's really a huge problem. So um, a total of 266 cases have been identified. 30 cases have been charged at court level, 11 cases in form warning, and 18 offenders confess guilt. So um, what our government did is to develop official website called sebenarnya.my, literally translated as truth.my, which give um, the real-time news approved by the ministry. And this um, website is supported by the federal government and agencies such as Royal Military Police and Malaysian Communication and Multimedia Commission. And um, availability of screening test kits. Um, truthfully speaking, uh, Malaysia did not have shortage of uh, test kits, but what we have been relying so far is on the PCR test, which diagnosed the presence of a novel coronavirus, which typically takes around six hours. And if the volume is quite huge, then it'll take up to 48 hours. So in fact, we don't have like in situ um, laboratories in um, hospital at the early stage. So what we do is that we learn from Korea. So we contacted Korea and we um, buy the new kit, antigen rapid, rapid test, test kit from Korea, which has a sensitivity rate of 84.4% and specificity rate of 100% to help this so that we could um, achieve our target of maximum capacity of 16,500 COVID tests per day. And then, of course, being Asian, you know, whenever these um, things uh, abrupt, we usually go back to from uh, our capital, from the place where we were working to our hometown. So this happens literally at the early stage. So what we're doing is that um, government was trying to put this at a stop. So most uh, federal highways, we allocate um, roadblocks so that whoever try to pass um, every state, they will be compound. So these are the typical things that you could see in our local highways. And since my friend mentioned before that we have this uh, big celebration, Eid Fitri, we were trying to avoid people from going out from um, the capital. So everyone needs to, to stay intact in their place to avoid the spreading of the virus. So this is how um, the celebration looked like. And this is how what happened during the real Hari Raya celebration. So we use uh, Zoom, Google Meet, and so forth. So um, 
at a glance. Of course, um, Malaysia has a lot of what, what I would say movement control order and definitely in every control order we have SOP, a, real, a really strict SOP to be followed. So as a conclusion, um, fast handling government through movement control order, roadblocks and so forth has been proven to be the most effective ways to can contain the disease. Every industry are required to follow SOP and open accordingly to phases to control the spread of the viruses. And then the roots of the problem need to be addressed to ensure that future recurring virus can be contained and prevented. Therefore, uh, we wanted more collaboration with the developed countries, such as funding the zoonotic disease research in these vulnerable countries. So we'll end up this presentation today by giving a huge thanks to um, our unsung heroes in Malaysia and definitely to other countries as well. So without them, we'll not be able to, you know, to be like this. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much. This was the presentation was from Team Malaysia. And as the last presentation, uh, the last presentation will be given by Team Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, because the participants uh, had to take final exam today, the team sent us a recording of the presentation. But uh, fortunately, uh, they finished the exam now and just came in. So. Now we are downloading the PPT file. So in a minute, uh, we will start the presentation. Hello everyone, my name is Marianne Chang and today I will be presenting on the COVID-19 country report for Trinidad and Tobago. I belong to the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering and I am pursuing currently a bioengineering master's degree. Uh, unfortunately, today I could not be a part of the live symposium, but I'm still grateful for the opportunity to present my research in this pre recorded format. Okay, so the agenda for today is as follows. I'm going to just give a brief introduction of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. So for those of you who don't know, we're a twin island republic consisting of Trinidad and a small island, Tobago. Together, we make up a population of about 1.36 million and are described as a diverse, multicultural, and multiracial society. The economy is fueled by the oil and gas sectors, as well as the tourism sector. Uh, since we'll be talking about the COVID-19 situation, I thought it was important to mention that our public health care system can be accessed free of charge by all residents. However, the, quarant the state quarantine has become a burden on the government, and this payment structure is now by the individual, however, um, however, the treatment costs are still free. Uh, the major event on our tourism calendar is Carnival, which is displayed in these pictures. Uh, Carnival is a two day, full two day event where masqueraders parade in the streets with their costumes from the Lost Drive, as shown in the pictures. This year, Carnival actually fell on the 24th and 25th of February, and many citizens were concerned about the spread of the disease um, it, during this parade. However, the event went on, the festivities went on as planned, and there were no recorded cases at this time. However, the first case came like about 16 days later on March 12th. This footage was a multi uh, cultural society with two Hindu festivals, a Muslim festival and a Christian festival highlighted. So now to show the chronological timeline um, of the events of COVID. As of January 31st, uh, COVID on, was placed, out of just, COVID was adjusted under the Public Health Ordinance um, Act in order to make special provisions for COVID-19. Uh, on the 11th, there was a declared a pandemic. Then our first case came one day later. On the 21st, we had a rise in cases to about 50. Full border closures one day later. And we had our first stay-at-home order issued 
on the 29th of March, which had to be subsequently extended until May 15th. Due to the stabil stabilization of cases, we then had the reopening of phase one starting on May 10th. So globally, if you look at the statistics, the respect to number of active cases among the regions, the Caribbean has around 50% active cases, and the other regions do not deviate too much from this, this figure. So I think this is a better representation to compare all of the regions rather than these large statistics. Uh, with respect to CARICOM member states, Trinidad and Tobago can be seen to have few cases with respect to the other members. These member states um, do not, however, include Puerto Rico and um, Dominican Republic, which also has a high number of cases within the region. This shows the specific cases for Trinidad and Tobago, which will be discussed in more detail in the next slide. Demographically, it can be seen that women were more disproportionately affected by the virus. Um, it's a little bit outdated, but the majority of our cases would have occurred at this time with 114 cases. So from the total number of cases, most were sporadic or due to imported cases, uh, with the vast majority occurring from the cruise ship. Uh, most active cases occurred from early, from late March to early April with a peak of 100 cases, which steadily declined until May 10th, where we have a fluctuation between one and zero cases. And again, we had a small spike of six active cases upon reopening of the borders to nationals. However, we also had a few cases that had no epidemiological link and as a result, we would have conducted community tests to um, which are returned negative. And uh, however, I don't think we could definitively rule out community spread as more testing, more community tests would be required. Okay, so there were a number of influencing factors with our COVID-19 control. Um, one such, um, one such category is an international cooperation. So China would have donated PPE to our frontline help which helped our frontline workers. Additionally, the Canadian government would have supplied funds through PAHO or diagnostic equipment, other medical supplies, etc. Respect to the government, they would have been monitoring the situation globally and as a result impose travel bans on passengers arriving from China within 14 days of their departure and later other countries were added to that list due to the continuous monitoring. Other measures for example include stay-at-home orders, the expansion of COVID testing facilities to reduce the impact on CAFA and as mentioned earlier the public health ordinance together with the police service to help impose fines, and a major one also was the social relief efforts through salary relief grants and other grants for income, food, and rental fee. Through academia, the Ministry of Health would have collaborated with experts in, um, from the UV Medical Sciences Complex from time to time. Uh, Regionally, CAFA is the single public health agency. And um, in addition to testing, they also have a periodic situation reports, technical advice, and others. So I think they were perhaps the most, one of the most influential in controlling the COVID-19 and like one of the main actors. Uh, CARICOM would have been, um, CARICOM consists of 20 countries that collaborate together to, um, for economic integration and foreign policy, etc. So CARICOM especially tried helping Haiti um, reduce their prison overcrowding and other member states. 
as KT currently has five times the maximum capacity in some of their facil detention facilities. Uh, looking at the private sector now, it was noted, it was reported that 10 ventilators were donated from oil and gas companies, and this would have helped um, boost our ICU units, ICU units, ICU department, sorry. Uh, also, community-based organizations and NGOs would have also contributed to daily supplies for vulnerable communities. So how has this exactly impacted Trinidad and Tobago? Well, early approximates of um, budget deficits were around 4.5 billion, but this was actually recently adjusted to around 14.5 billion in the mid-year review report by the Honorable Minister of Finance, like a week ago. And uh, also to with border closures, our tourism sector across the entire Caribbean, which is generally heavily reliant on this sector, as it employs around 2.4 million people. So this this will have also been greatly impacted. Uh, Education-wise, tertiary, education, tertiary examinations would have been delayed by a few weeks, but I think the primary and secondary schools would have suffered more, and they've been more affected as their exams are uh, still um, being scheduled right now. Uh, the retrenchment is also another important effect. Um, specifically with respect to like the airline industry and other industries that could not work from home. So they would have been loosely affected by the COVID-19 effects. So, some of the challenges as a result of this, uh, these impacts, these budget deficits will now further increase our debt to GDP ratio to just over about 70% now. This gives us less spending money and room for development. Um, as a result, alternative revenue streams should be, should be explored. So, in this same vein, Professor Carl Theodore, an economist, suggested import substitution to decrease the, our reliance on global imports and increase our production of, say, foods that we usually import so that these savings can be transferred towards uh, our exports like oil and gas, cement, iron, tobacco, etc., and, well, new ones as well. Uh, this delay in reopening of borders is due to the uncertainty, especially in Trinidad and Tobago's case, due to the low viral load of um, within the population. So we're at a high risk of contracting the disease, and as a result, the reopening of the border has to be carefully considered. Loss of jobs could lead to increase in crime as the government's efforts to provide safety nets with social relief grants cannot, would, might not, would not be able to inc incorporate everyone and as a result crime could potentially increase. Additionally, the increased burdens on healthcare system due to the management of the total number of cases and interestingly, too, we are now in the hurricane season, and this further complicates the, the impacts and the challenges because this could potentially increase the vulnerabilities in the Caribbean. Firstly, in terms of prevention and preparation, uh, you have to prepare the shelters in a different way. So in um, keeping with CDC social distancing guidelines, and then if disaster strikes, the, the infrastructure and the organized systems that we currently have in place for COVID could be greatly affected. So this is, um, she, the PAHO director urged as a result, the countries to not be sidetracked by COVID and make the necessary preparations for this hurricane season. So now looking, Comparatively at South Korea and TNT, 
South Korea has a long history of infectious diseases, so they would have handled SARS, H1N1, and especially MERS. I think MERS and SARS would have prepared them for COVID because they have some similar respiratory symptoms. However, Trinidad, in comparison, has a history with some uh, infectious diseases, as shown, but still wasn't still didn't deal with a pandemic of this magnitude. Uh, I think another two important factors contributing to South Korea's success of dealing with the situation, COVID-19, is that they had wide-scale testing, um, which would help determine their community spread, as well as the tracing to, to track the spread and help the control of the disease. Whereas for Trinidad and Tobago in comparison, yes, there's um, approximately 50%, 50, 50 times less population, but still only two facilities for COVID testing and tracing response appears weak. Therefore, as a result, you can see the differences with lockdown measures opposed to no lockdown measures which were imposed. As a result, I think you could still say that However, that these two countries took the appropriate response necessary for their respective circumstances. Looking at Trinidad and Tobago against other countries of similar population, they're generally, Trinidad was generally more superior. However, I think it's pretty difficult to make these analyses and without acknowledging like the other multitude of other contributing factors, time of border closures, health system capabilities, degree of lockdown, etc. So I think it's very important again to stress that the governments need to scale their response in line with their capabilities and their needs, but must prioritize the health of the population. So in conclusion, I'd just like to highlight some key lessons learned from this situation. Currently, TNT only has six active cases, despite the staggered influx of more than 560 nationals from June 1st. So this is an optimistic point. I think it's also important that the population should not get too relaxed and too comfortable with the COVID-19 situation, and therefore should still be constantly reminded of following the new normal guidelines so that we wouldn't we wouldn't have to go back, go backwards, but we can head forward in dealing with the situation. These two points here now are very important for government and leaders to make informed evidence-based decisions by carefully balancing the pros and cons with again prioritizing health of the population. This will help them to not make any unnecessary risks. And lastly, this is this could be considered a positive impact of COVID, the diversification of the economy, which was needed before COVID, but due to COVID, it has now brought about this urgency for the government to really find other alternative streams of revenue in order to survive. Um, I thank you very much for your attention up to this point, and on this note, I will end. I ask if there are any questions, you can forward it to my email in the report. And um, thank you very much for the opportunity to present.